Hello and welcome to Making Sense of Modernity, lecture number two, where we will start to explore the issue of what is modernity in slightly more depth than we managed to do last week. Um, there will be a Q&A hosted through Microsoft Teams so that you can flag up any issues you're not sure about or topics you want covered in more depth, for example, um, to supplement this lecture which you can listen to at your own leisure. So today we'll look at a number of theories of modernity and start encouraging you to think about how these um, ideas, theories, concepts apply to your own life. So it's not all just abstract notions, it's things you can relate directly to your own lived experience. And we'll get on to talking about the theories of Thomas Malthus and how his ideas um, both described the world as he experienced it at least and started to influence government policy and social thinking in the um, centuries since Thomas Malthus's death. So let's start by thinking about modernity in terms of the period we are talking about which we started to look at the early aspects of this last week and this is just kind of starting to flesh it out so we are approximately talking the period between 1650 and 1950 um, with ish in brackets because these things are not completely neatly defined by very specific events but just approximate periods of time which may lead you to ask where are we now if modernity ended somewhere around 1950 we are now arguably in the period of post-modernity although there are some sociologists who argue that post-modernity itself has now come to its end and we're as is so often the case with these phases they don't tend to get a label put on them until they're over and done with so at the time you're actually living through them you don't know you're living through them it's only in retrospect that historians and sociologists and anthropologists and what have you start describing periods of time as this era or that era. Uh, modernity in that period, so you've got described there of 300-ish uh, years, is primarily related to European history, which is not to say that modernity hasn't been experienced in Asia or Africa or um, Southeast Asia and China, Japan and so on. It has, certainly has been. Um, Japan is a very, very modernised country when it comes to industrial impact. However, they may have started in different countries, different parts of the world. It started at different times and arguably, of course, ended at different times. So this, for the purposes of this particular lecture, we'll take a mostly European focus and think about other areas of the world as we go along on the rest of the course. And we will, towards the end of the course, get on to what postmodernism is um, now that we supposedly live in a postmodernist era what does that actually mean so we'll think about that towards the end of the course partly it's associated modernism that is not postmodernism with the big technological revolutions that we were starting to mention last week but along with the technological revolutions there is a, a sense of changing outlook changing perception of what life is like, what the world is like for the majority of people within it, or in this case what Europe is like for the majority of people within it. Has our outlook changed? Now when Christianity became dominant in Europe round about the third century give or take, as it moved from being a very much minority religion to become bigger and bigger and bigger and became the dominant religion of the Roman Empire and through that pretty much most of the world. The ideology taught within Christianity at that junction, it still is taught this particular aspect of Christianity, whilst other elements of teaching have changed over time, this particular aspect has remained consistent, that humanity began its existence in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and so forth. And in the Garden of Eden, although Cain and Abel didn't exist in the Garden of Eden, they came along later, but whilst Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they were enjoying this period of, of wonderment when all life existed in harmony and it was beautiful and glorious and smashing uh, and just, just a joy to be alive. We can find a very similar perception in the 
religions of the ancient Greeks, who argued that in the distant, distant past, humanity had existed in what it referred to as the Golden Age, this wonderful, harmonious, smashing period in which everything was good and people lived peacefully and life was wonderful. Similar ideas can be found in India within the teachings of the Jain religion, who see this, this wonderful past that's now over and done with. Whether we're talking the ancient Greeks, um, Christianity, the Jain religion, or a number of other religions which have similar kinds of beliefs, that period of, of loveliness, of wonderfulness, of beauty and harmony and peace and contentment and joy ended. Now, in the Bible, it ended because humanity rebelled against God and didn't do as they were told decided to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is usually described as an apple, but it never actually says apple in the Bible, it just says fruit. They decided to, to eat the forbidden fruit and they got the royal boot out of the Garden of Eden and had to go into the world beyond Eden. And the world beyond Eden was a step down. Likewise for the Greeks, eventually the Golden Age ended and other less pleasurable ages came into existence, such as the Silver Age. And that too ended, and eventually we end up where we are now, which is kind of going downhill, downhill, downhill all the way from a, a Greek perspective. Are we in a period of decline in which the past was better than the present? That fundamentally is the perception that exists to the ancient Greeks, that exists within Christianity, as it was taught in its early days and persisted to be taught for a long time afterwards, We're, to an extent within Jainism, although Jainism is a cyclical religion, that the past was better than the present. And therefore we, we have a life of regret, in effect, of nostalgia, of looking back on this wonderful golden time and thinking how much better and luckier we were then before it all went wrong when we ended up in the state we're in now. A state in which people have to work for a living and drudge and do things they don't enjoy. In which food sometimes runs out and, and water and other drinkables run out. And so we have periods of famine and periods of thirst in which there are diseases that rack the body and torment the mind. In which there is warfare and lying and cheating and backstabbing and, and molesting and all sorts of horrible things go on. But once upon a time we didn't have any of that and now we do. Um, different religions argue different causes as to why we now have the, the grim stuff and why we lost the good. But the, the uniting theory of many religions is this sense of a downhill slope. That argument began to change partly in Europe due to changes in um, Christianity as there were schisms and rifts and things went in different directions from a philosophical perspective, different notions came to the fore. And if you're interested in that, we can certainly incorporate more of that into future lessons. If you're not, fair enough, we'll focus on other things. An argument advanced from a more rationalist, more um, scientific perhaps we can put it like that perspective that came up or began to emerge during the enlightenment period was that the world is actually getting better rather than getting worse it's referred to as a as meliorism meliorism is the philosophical perspective that that each year is better than the one that went before it each generation of humans is more developed than the ones that went before them the world is gradually getting a better and better and better place, rather than the opposite view of it getting a worse and worse and worse place. Uh, and so it's perceived as a step up. And so whilst you could be a scientist and have that very kind of downhill slope, there's no view, there's no reason why you couldn't. In practice, science is, or well, has been for a few hundred years now, sold to the public as the key to improving life. Medicine gets better, inventions make life easier, more contented, deal with our various different problems, uh, resolve mental distress in various different ways. Things improve 
through the application of science. Whether that, of course, is always true is somewhat a matter of perspective, because you could certainly point to things like nuclear warfare as products of science, things that wouldn't exist without scientific invention, which really don't appear to make life much better for anyone. As let's face it, if we have a full-on nuclear warfare, there won't be life for much of anyone. So it, there, there is a, a degree of, shall we say, selectivity in whether we choose to look at what it is, whether we choose to look at the negatives, or whether we choose to look at a little bit of both. It would be interesting to find your view. Do you perceive your own life, let alone the world at large, as gradually getting better and better, or do you see it as getting worse and worse? Or possibly you think it's just staying much of a muchness uh, and not really going up or down in terms of general improvement. Let's put a, a modern spin on this, a very modern spin. Um, the environmental movements, Extinction Rebellion, various other campaigns around the world often talk about how many years we have left to sort out the world before it's all too late and we have mass extinctions and flooding and famine and plague and doom and disaster and a general apocalypse of almost religious um, size and perspective. And this is presented as scientific fact that we definitely do have this. It's not just a, a, a guess, a stab in the dark. It's a definite thing that is actually happening. Do you feel that we are approaching some kind of environmental disaster? Or do you think that's scaremongering and actually we can resolve these problems quite straightforwardly um, and that the world will be, is getting to be a better place? Do you feel the um, march of civil rights, whether that is for people of different ethnic backgrounds or for women versus men, for gay people compared to straight people, whatever other groups you might be interested in thinking about, do you feel that in let's say Europe, things are getting better. Is it better to be a woman in 2020 than it was to be a woman in 1920 or 1620 or 1320? Is it better to be working class now than it was in those centuries? Is it better to be uh, gay or bisexual now than it was in those centuries? Is it better to be a member of an ethnic minority? living in a country where most people are of a different ethnicity to yourself, is it better now than it used to be in the past? Or is it worse now? Or is it much of a muchness, not largely changed? Because we can understand this notion of things getting better or things getting worse, we really need to break it down in terms of what is getting better, what is getting worse. Is it the technology? Is it uh, political liberties and freedoms? Is it standard of living? Is it health care? Is it environmental issues? Because some things may get better and other things may get worse. And overall, we're trying to get a sense of perspective as to where society is going. Is modern modernity, modernism, something which is an improvement on the past? Or is it a disaster? Or is it a bit of both? This is where we could open to reflection and discussion and get some of your feedback during the Microsoft Teams discussion on the subject. Speaking of breaking it down into different areas, we can think of the, this is just a sample of different areas. There are other things we could add. Um, how things have changed. Now, whether you feel they've changed for the better or changed for the worse is, is a, an individual perspective, but they have certainly changed. We won't go over all of these because bits and pieces of this will pick up on the, as we go along anyway. But um, as, as a brief summation of some elements of this, economically, if we go back to, let's say, the um, 1500s in Europe, as indeed in, in many, many, many parts of the world, we had a feudalist economy, which if you are unfamiliar with the term means we had an aristocracy, lords and ladies, dukes, barons, earls, countesses, kings and queens. And the people who worked the land, the, the ones who did all the farming and the hoeing and the digging and the sowing and so on, they were serfs, peasants if you like, who were reliant and indeed owned by 
and it's, it's basically slavery under a different name, owned by the local lord or lady of the manor, and uh, needed permission to travel beyond the manor, needed permission to move house into a completely different manor. The lord of the manor protected them militarily and was meant to be in charge of supervising storage of grain and so on, such that in times of famine there would be aid for the local population from all of the food that had been stored up in years with better harvests. And in exchange for such protections, the local serfs, the local peasants, would till the land, pay their taxes, obey the law, and if the lord or lady of the manor wanted to um, wage war, then the local fit and healthy male population would up sticks and join that small-scale army and march off to wherever the lord or lady of the manor told them to march off to. The majority of people worked in agriculture, the vast majority of people worked on farms tilling the land or with the animals on the land. Nowadays, of course, the modernism we have investment capitalism in which we, rather than lords and ladies, we have um, supremely rich industrialists who invest vast amounts of money in businesses, setting up businesses which they themselves might not know how to run the machines in the factories, but they hire in people who do and pay them a wage and dictate their hours, when to turn up for work, when to go home, when to have their dinner break and all the rest of it. And they set the prices of, of what they sell their manufactured goods for. Um, most people these days in the West, and indeed most other countries for that matter, work in industry rather than on a farm. There are still farmers around, clearly, but the vast majority of people work in industry in some form or another. We've gone from periods in, of history, back to the 1500s, of having emperors, kings, queens, a ruling elite, to having by and large an elected elite of presidents and prime ministers with some form of democracy. Certainly in Europe and indeed in large swathes of the rest of the world. There are kings and queens like our own one around, but for the most part they are figureheads rather than the kinds of dictators that their distant ancestors were. We can cast our votes now. And last week we, we discussed this a little bit and most of you expressed the opinion that even if you sometimes feel your vote doesn't achieve much of anything, you do value it and would object to some government arbitrarily trying to take your vote away from you. So it gives ordinary citizens a sense of having some clout, some influence, some say in what goes on at a national level that we are not simply serfs owned by the local lord of the manor. We have freedoms, we have rights, we have protections from the state and from the agents of the state should they start misusing their powers. Does this mean that presidents and prime ministers are completely unlike the kings and queens and emperors of previous centuries? Well, that's when we could dis debate and discuss in person perhaps. There are maybe some presidents and prime ministers who act rather like they are uh, the kings and queens of former centuries but whether we expect them to or not is another issue. Uh, population wise back in the 1500s there was a very high birth rate. Most women had 8, 9, 10, 11 children but equally most of them would have died very young which is still the case, of course, in some parts of the world to this very day, where people have a lot of children and by and large, very, very few of them survive to adulthood. These days, the birth rate in the Western world and in technologically advanced parts of the rest of the world has by and large come down. Women are having fewer children. On average, there are exceptions, of course, of women who do have big families, but by and large, they have fewer children. And the children they do have, for the most part, tend to survive to adulthood. There are tragedies where babies and toddlers and young children die, of course. But by and large, most children born in the West will live to adulthood. And not simply live to be 20 or 30, 
but easily live to be 80, 90 or 100. And indeed the, the lifespan is going up. Whilst there are examples of people from the 10th century who lived to be 80 or 90, they were very, very rare. These days it's quite common to get people living to such an advanced age. Understandings of knowledge have changed significantly. Um, they've not doesn't mean that the knowledge systems of the past have been dropped entirely. They still exist, but in adapted and amended forms. Um, theological knowledge is knowledge of religion or knowledge that comes from and via religion. So people back in the 1500s wanting to know about the world would have turned to the Bible or the Quran, depending on which part of the world they lived in, or indeed the Rig Vedas or the Upanishads and a variety of other books in other parts of the world, and learned about the world through a religious text. They might have turned to priests or imams or rabbis or, or pundits or any one of a number of um, administers of religion, priestly castes, for guidance and advice. People consulted sometimes oracles. There's a whole variety of different systems used in different parts of the world where people might pray to a saint or to Christ or the Virgin Mary or to Allah, pray for guidance, pray for insight. They might go and consult someone who was believed to have powers of second sight to gain information from the spirit world to advise them about what to do in their life or what the future would hold for them. And of course people still do. That's not a thing completely of the past. It's just rarer now than it used to be. More common now is the scientific or rationalist approach that rather than necessarily always turning to holy books or priests of one description or another, we tend to turn to scientific texts and people in lab, co lab coats holding clipboards rather than people in priestly vestments. At least for some issues we do. And we expect science to be able to advise us on different things. Um, not just the kinds of things that people were investigating hundreds of years ago, chemistry, metallurgy, geology and things like that. We expect science to be able to answer questions such as why are some people gay and other people straight and other people bisexual. We expect science to answer questions such as why do some people suffer mental illness and other people never appear to suffer mental illness. Once upon a time we might have turned to a priest, and of course many people still do, in fairness, but it's more common to assume science can answer those questions now than to assume religion can answer those sorts of questions. So things have changed. Have they changed for the better, for the worse? Or is this just a more kind of a neutral change with some, some bits good and some bits bad? Interesting to hear your points of view on that one. This is a visual depiction of feudal society. So you have the, the peasants, the serfs right at the bottom, the people who do all the hard manual labour, dig the ditches, plough the fields, muck out the cattle, do all that sort of thing. Then above them you have various vassals and knights, um, and uh, the knights were almost entirely ma male. There are some cases of women disguising themselves as men in order to serve as knights, but by and large almost all of the knights were male, but their wives were at the same tier of society as their husbands. The sort of lo the local um, military, the local heavy duty section of society, Above them, the lords, the ladies, the dukes, the earls, the barons, and duchesses and countesses. And within the church, you can probably see you've got a monk there and a bishop there in that picture as well. Uh, they are, if you like to put it this way, the aristocracy of the church, whereas the others are the aristocracy of secular society. So bishops held tremendous power in Catholic countries. Cardinals also held even more power and sway and influence over the ways of society. And above them, at the very pinnacle, you have the king, or sometimes a queen in different periods of history, as the absolute top of the shop. In some countries that would be an emperor, or a czar, rather than the king or a queen. Um, 
but uh, the effect is much the same. Everyone owes allegiance to the level above them. And everyone hopes that the level above them know what they're doing, because if they don't, things can go horribly wrong. This system is no longer in place, or at least isn't supposed to be in place anymore. Let's put it like that. As we were touching upon a little bit last week, we could ask questions as to quite how much the class system has changed in Britain, or other parts of the world for that matter. Do we still have, rather than peasants and serfs, do we have a working class that does all the heavy duty manual labour? Perhaps these days, rather than knights in shining armour, we have professional classes, academic classes, the middle classes, the doctors, the professors, the barristers, the architects, the people that carry out those more high paid and also often more um, complex in terms of the level of training and education required, those sorts of tasks, and start to inform systems of government above them but we, we do, do still have dukes and earls and counts and so forth but perhaps they don't have quite the same position in society that they used to hundreds and hundreds of years ago do we these days maybe have the upper middle classes or perhaps mps those in a position to influence politics shape government policy so even if some of those mps tiny number of them come from working class or poorer backgrounds once they get into government, they're obviously being paid a hefty wage packet and often getting large sums of money from various other sources and bodies and boards and quangos and whatnot that they may sit on. So whatever their financial starting point in life, by the time they're in government, they are by no sense of the word poor and able to draw on their wealth, their connections, their influence not just whilst they're in Parliament, but also after they retire or lose their seats or, or just chuck it in and get fed up with it. They still continue to have a lot of influence in society. We do still have a Queen, although it's debatable how much influence she has over the running of government. So perhaps it would be better these days to put the Prime Minister at the top of the pyramid rather than the Queen, in as much as the Prime Minister has much more hands-on clout than the Queen herself does. Uh, the, those slightly more cynically inclined might suspect that even the Prime Minister is answerable to other forces, billionaires rather than millionaires, industrialists, people of enormous international clout, media giants and so forth, who may have a tremendous influence over the Prime Minister, not just this current one, but every single Prime Minister. Um, are there people behind the scenes pulling the strings who are at the top of the pyramid rather than the person who is officially at the top of the pyramid? Or is this indeed, you may feel, a complete um, thing of the distant past and modern day society is far more liberated and has a greater deal of social mobility as people move up and down the scale? Have things changed? Charles Taylor in one of his books, published back in 1995, proposed the idea of two models, two systems to understand the process of change. He spoke about cultural change and a cultural change. So cultural change involves looking at two cultures. Now that could be two different countries, let's say um, India and um, Germany, for argument's sake and comparing India to Germany. How are they different in various ways? Or it could involve looking at the same country, but in different centuries, in different periods of time. So you could look at Britain in the 12th century and Britain in the 21st century. Or as the example on the screen there, Italy in the 10th century versus Italy in the 21st century. And say, how has this country changed in that long stretch of time? Does it have the same religion? Does it have new technologies? Has the language changed? Do people dress differently? Do they eat differently? Do they have a different social structure? Or the same, 
And in looking at two cultures in this way, um, Taylor argued not only can you spot the changes and see how they're different from each other, um, how, how they uh, run in different ways, but you can also start looking at possible causations of those change. So you could look at things that happened in Italy between the 10th century and the 21st century. You could look at the Second World War, the First World War, various plagues and upheavals and famines, political unity and disunity and all the rest of it. A cultural change, by contrast, here's his second model, said that, um, again, you, you look at two different periods of history or you look at two different countries or indeed broader sets of countries, because you don't have to just look at two countries, you could look at the whole of Europe, for example, or the whole of Africa or the whole of Asia. You could look at um, broad swathes of countries that are united by features in some way. And then look at big, broad shifts. So not only would you be saying, well, do the Germans speak the same language today as they did 500 years ago, that you could be looking at all of the neighbours and thinking what issues have affected not just one country but many countries in this particular period of time or in this particular land mass such as Europe or Africa or Asia. So it may, I mean, some wars are very localised, they happen in one country and they don't have a great deal of impact on the countries around them. Um, but other wars sweep from one country to the next, to the next, to the next, like the Second World War, which take in half the planet, well, more than half the planet, uh, and impact vast numbers of people. And not just in terms of very destructive things like warfare or plagues that sweep from country to country to country, like the Black Death did. You can also think in terms of technological revolutions such as the Industrial Revolution, which went across the whole world, or the Artificial Intelligence Revolution, which we're experiencing at the moment, which is flowing across the whole world. But you can also think in terms of philosophical change, like the move towards rationalism, or when Christianity first arrived in the world, or when Islam first arrived in the world and began to spread from nation to nation to nation, and how an idea can have a huge impact, not just on one country, but on many, many, many countries. And it's this, rather than the kind of small approach of cultural change, a cultural change takes in a much bigger picture and places a uh, change in a very broad context of how it impacts lots of countries rather than just one or two countries. Modernity and notions of modernity sit within the acculturation model in that modernity doesn't just influence one country, it influences the whole world over. It obviously does arrive at different times, so it may be years apart or indeed centuries apart from starting in one country to um, arriving in another, but it ripples across the world. Or does it? Most sociologists theorise that modernity has indeed impacted the entire world. But it doesn't mean you have to accept what most sociologists say. You may have your own views, your own ideas, your own experiences of this from what you've seen or read round and or so forth. Um, so do you feel that all of the world has modernised? Or are there parts of the world, maybe places you've lived in, in the past or you've been on holiday to or you worked in some foreign country for a while do you have experiences you can draw upon of other parts of the world which you feel have sort of dodged modernity where modernity simply hasn't made much difference to the way of life in that country or it may, may not be the whole country it may be just a region within a country where modernity doesn't appear to have made much of an impact and something perhaps to raise in the uh, team's discussion, as well as maybe in future lessons, bringing in your own views, your own experiences of the world at large. Are there some changes that can be resisted? When Christianity was sweeping across the world, not every country became Christian. Plenty of countries aren't. Likewise, when Islam swept across the world, there are plenty of countries that have not become Muslim. 
is it equally possible to resist the advance of technology? Is it equally possible to resist the spread of, say, feminism? Or is that something that every single country will experience at some point? If it hasn't already, it's only a matter of time, perhaps. Or are there countries that will raise their hand and say, nope, we are not interested in that. We don't want that phenomena, whether we're talking a religion or a political ideology or a type of technology or whatever it might be, but where they might say, we don't want that here. And if they say that and, and succeed in, in blocking, who is it that's doing the saying? Is it the leaders of the country? Is it the general population in the country? A particular section of the population? Are there things that we have resisted in Britain that have happened in other parts of the world and we've gone, no, we don't want that, thank you very much. Something to mull over. Whilst you're mulling, and you might want to go and get a cup of tea while you mull and pause this video and then come back again. We can think about Auguste Comte's ideas. Some of these he expressed in a book back in 1842. He did write several. He spoke about there being three main styles of change. And he felt that some of these changes tend to go in a certain order. So that you can look at a country and say, well, in one period it was this stage, and then in another period it was at that stage, and then in a few centuries down the line it was in this other stage. Um, so, for example, he argues the theological stages, which he says begin with fetishism. Now, that's nothing to do with sexual fetishism, you know, whips and chains and all that kind of thing. Fetishism in this context, an anthropological context, means an object which is held to have magical power, like a totem pole, for example, or a, uh, a drum, which is believed to be possessed by a spirit so that the, the, the shaman or witch doctor or whatever their title happens to be in that particular country can, can beat the drum and raise up the spirits and um, perform a ceremony in which people can commune with the spirits. So fetishism is the idea of spirits uh, other people, uh, historians and, and religious studies specialists and so forth, often refer to this by the term animism rather than fetishism. The belief that objects have spirits living within them and that these spirits can be communicated with. And not only objects, but human beings have spirits, a soul, but so do trees, so do animals of every which species going. All things have spirits and they can be communicated with. From there, he said, society tends to move into the polytheist stage, which is where certain spirits become viewed as more and more and more important until they are elevated to the status of gods. And then they're not simply little local spirits. They are full on deities, gods of the universe, as it were. And the, the nature of polytheism is that you have more than one spirit. So whilst monotheism, the next stage on, has one god, polytheism has lots, lots of gods, lots of goddesses. Uh, you could take, for example, the ancient Greek religion, the ancient um, Celtic religion of the Druids. You could look at Shintoism in Japan, Taoism in China. A lot of African traditional religions have multiple deities. From polytheism, he said the next theological stage to move on to is monotheism. So you end up going from lots and lots of gods to having one single god. And that one single god, whether you call him, her, it, depending on how the gender is conceived of in a given religion, um, call it God, call, it, call, call the being Allah, call the being any name you want to call the being, there is just one of them. And that one deity frequently reveals itself to humanity through a sacred scripture like the Quran or the Bible or the um, Rig Vedas. I don't know this box appearing on the screen. Sorry about that. I'll get rid of that in a second. Um, for Comte, cultures start in fetishism 
move to polytheism and then eventually develop into monotheism. And that's where Comte felt they kind of rested because he saw monotheism as a superior theological manifestation to the previous two stages. Uh, confirmed atheists like Richard Dawkins often suggest there should be a fourth phase, which is atheism. So you go from lots of spirits to lots of gods to one god to no god. Um, naturally enough, each person tends to assume that their religion is the the end product, their faith, their conviction, their philosophy is the best one you can have and better than all the ones that have gone before it and that there'll be nothing better to follow on after it. So if we wait around long enough there might be someone suggesting a fifth theological stage after atheism that will be some other ism. It's worth noting that of course this doesn't pan out historically. We can look at countries, Britain is an example, where we can say in the distant past Britain used to be polytheist, now it's by and large Christian monotheist. But equally we can look to other parts of the world that haven't become monotheist and have no intention of becoming monotheist. Other parts of the world where polytheism or fetishism, animism, is still prevalent. So it doesn't always follow in the kind of logical one step leading to the next to the next that Auguste Comte suggested it would. But there are lots of ways of understanding the nature of the universe. Um, possibly we could argue certain of these ways are more closely associated with modernity than others are. Uh, the metaphysical stage is the period in which um, Potentially there is a move away from monotheism, although not always, sometimes it goes hand in glove with monotheism, and the universe is understood less in terms of specific gods and goddesses, or a singular god, or indeed a singular goddess, but more in abstract terms of forces, depersonalised forces. So in India and parts of the world with a significant Indian diaspora, the notion of karma is widely discussed, the notion of cause and effect that for every act we take there is a reaction. We build up both positive and negative karma and we have to account for this over a period of many reincarnations. So it's, it's not karma is not a god, karma is a force of the cosmos, a force of nature that affects every being within nature. The positivity stage, which Comte describes, is the stage which Richard Dawkins is most contented with. Now, whereas Auguste Comte did not say that the positivity stage had to be full on atheist, Richard Dawkins suggests you can't be effectively scientific and religious at the same time, because he sees them in contradiction. It's worth bearing in mind that for the vast majority of human history, up until very, very recently, science and religion went hand in glove. An awful lot of science was produced from within the churches and the mosques and the synagogues and so on, rather than by people outside them. But the positivity stage is the search for explanation for testing and retesting based on the scientific method. And rather than opening a holy book to find out about the world, you would open a scientific book to find out about the world, or a turn to a scientist rather than turning to a priest to help explain the world to you more clearly. Which you could argue is, is pretty much where modern day Britain is by and large in that positivity stage. There are still a lot of religious people in Britain of all sorts of religious persuasions, but government tends to run more so along loosely scientific lines rather than um, religious lines. If, if a, a politician, an MP, wants to justify some policy, they are more likely to justify it using statistics and research and data of a roughly scientific nature than they are to try and justify it by reading verses from the Bible or quoting the Quran or whatever. 
Um, so the, the, the turn is towards science rather than towards religion these days. Doesn't mean this, that the positivity stage is the end all and be all. There's nothing to, to say that there might not be another stage after that. Time will tell. Okay, not everyone is um, overly joyful uh, about Comte's notion of, of the progress from one stage to the other to the other. Uh, even within 21st century Britain, we can see the fact that we have all of those stages coexisting at the same time. So whilst the perhaps majority might slide more towards the uh, positivist scientific frame of mind, there's plenty of Christians, there's plenty of Muslims, there's Jewish people, Hindu people, Buddhist people, there are pagans and Wiccans and Druids and all manner of religious outlooks within 21st century Britain. There are um, Jungians within psychology espousing a metaphysics that sits well in that metaphysics category that Comte described. We have all of these ideas knocking around in Britain, let alone plenty of other countries as well, at the same time. And whilst some of these ideas may only be held by a fairly small number of people within a country, other ideas are held by much larger numbers of people. And some ideas are held simultaneously. So there are scientists who are also Christians, scientists who are also Hindus, scientists who are also Sikhs who have a religious view and a scientific view at one and the same time. So again, they're not mutually exclusive in the way that Auguste Comte started to think of them as, as kind of society ditches one stage and moves solidly into the next stage. It doesn't work in quite such a, a neat fashion. It, it's a bit more of a coexistence than a, a sort of a, a jump, big jump from one stage to the next stage. Now, if you want to use this juncture to pause the video, make yourself a cup of tea or something, a cup of coffee, whatever, and mull over this for a few minutes, jot some ideas down on a bit of scrap paper, and then we can discuss them in the Teams um, chat. As to your views of British society, so having asked earlier about your experiences of other countries when you might have been on holiday or living abroad or whatever, um, what are your views of British society? Now, obviously, none of you are old enough to have been around 500 years ago, but you may have a knowledge of history and you may regard the country as having improved in some ways. And there may be other ways in which you think we've actually gone backwards and, uh, and lost the plot a bit. There may be other ways in which you think we're neither better nor worse. We just swapped one set of problems for a different set of problems. Would you sooner be alive in 2020, 1920, 1820, 1720? When would you prefer to have lived? Not just for the sake of dressing up in fancy costumes and parading around on a, a jolly day out at some kind of you know, history theme park, but to actually live there with the standard of food and sanitation and medication and all the rest of it that was present in Britain at that time. It would be interesting to get your views not only on other parts of the world you've got experience of, but also upon British society as it's changed over 500 years. And your sense of, of um, whether modernity has brought with it great improvements, great problems, a combination of both. Another sociological thinker, Elias, um, in a particular book back in, uh, published in 2000, says that whilst modernity has improved in a lot of ways, you know, sanitation is much better now than it was 200 years ago, uh, medicine is much better now than it was 400 years ago, etc. It's not nice, neat, orderly progression where everything gets better and better and better at the same pace. But there are points in history, points in time, where a country or several countries simultaneously far from going constantly forward in a line of progression, sometimes derail and go in a different direction, go backwards or sideways or diagonally, whatever direction you want to 
imagine it as being. Um, obviously, the photograph of Hitler there and the Na members of the Nazi Party is a an example of a country which, um, well, they thought they were going forward, I'm sure, but the majority of other people around the world tend to see that as a massive backward step, where advances and developments, at least in terms of, of civil rights and how people were treating each other at a humane level, their technology may have been improving, but other aspects of their society were just thrown down the drain and things became significantly worse. They're a very obvious example. You might be able to think of other examples from other parts of the world in which society seems to have taken a massive step back. Maybe not forever, but, may, but perhaps for a few months or a few years where things derailed and, and we had counter, what Elias calls counter civilization, rather than the progress of civilization. And Elias is interested in understanding why sometimes when everything seems to be getting better and better and better, all of a sudden there is a big upsurge in some political movement or religious movement or whatever kind of a movement and things go massively backwards and there, there are real problems and major social issues for vast numbers of people. What leads a community, whether it could be anything from a small village all the way up to an entire country with millions and millions and millions of people living in it, what leads to this sudden turning backwards, this sudden um, counter movement to progress? Your thoughts on that will be interesting to hear. We'll find out more about Elias's thoughts as to quite what causes these backward movements in future weeks as we look at other examples of periods in time where society has gone very odd. Now, from a sociological point of view, you will be hearing about agency and structure in your other modules, but um, to clarify these concepts within this module before we move on, sociologists argue that there are these two big forces that we need to factor in. Um, some people suggest there's more than two big forces, but certainly at least two big forces that we need to factor in, and these are agency and structure. As those terms are used within sociology, and obviously in engineering, structure means something else entirely, but within sociology, agency is your capacity to choose, my capacity to choose, anybody's capacity to choose that um, I'm sitting here drinking a cup of coffee. I chose to drink that cup of coffee. I could have chosen to have tea or water or, well, any one of a number of a dozen different things, but I chose coffee. I exercised my agency, my capacity to choose. And at one level, you might say, well, so what? What does it matter if he's drinking tea, coffee or anything else? And of course, at one level, it doesn't matter which of those I'm drinking. Except from a sociological point of view, it becomes interesting to understand how agency starts to shape the person, starts to shape them as an individual. So one of the elements within agency is the notion of iteration. Iteration means to repeat a pattern, to do something again and again and again. So I, over the course of um, 50 odd years, I've got used to drinking coffee. When I was very young, I didn't like coffee at all, but I got used to drinking it. My constant repetition of patterns means that when I go shopping, I tend to go down the aisle with the tea bags and coffee, and I reach for certain things rather than other things, because those are the things I've chosen in the past, and I'm more likely to choose them again in the future. Now, there is nothing per se to stop me choosing a completely different thing off the shelf in the shop, but in practice, I tend to get used to making certain types of choices and so tend to make those types of choices again and again and again. In the same way that if I nip into Berry for lunch, I tend to go to the same place because I like the food they serve, I, li I like the staff there, they're friendly and polite and what have you. I could choose to go somewhere completely different, but I, I don't in practice because having made the choice once and discovered I like the results, I go back to it. Maybe I'm just remarkably boring and predictable, but most of us to some extent are quite predictable 
in the sense that we, having made a choice successfully once, we're more likely to make this a choice a second, a third, a 510th time. Another element of exerting our free will, our agency, is projectivity. To what extent are we able to imagine our future? Part of that is, for example, imagining consequences. If I choose to do this, then so-and-so thing might happen as a result. Uh, within the realm of criminology, that's often applied in the sense that somebody may say to themselves, if I steal that expensive jewellery, I might get caught and I might go to prison and I don't like those options, therefore I choose not to steal that expensive piece of jewellery. Other people don't seem quite as um, adept at projecting the future choices. They're a bit more impulsive. They think short term rather than long term. And there's all sorts of factors involved in why some people think short term and other people are better suited to thinking long term. One of which evidence suggests is money in the bank. The more money you've got, the better at thinking long term you tend to be. Doesn't guarantee for every single case, but you tend to be better at it the more resources you've got at your disposal. We can think about the reasons for that in the future lesson. Um, it's not only the capacity to think about the consequences of your actions, but also to think about what will life be like for me in 10 years time, 15, 20 years time. That's why we have pension plans, because we have that capacity to think, well, when I am so-and-so age, I want to be living this kind of a life and I want to have this much money and I want to be able to go on holiday and do this and do that and do the other. So we're starting to think as to what our lives might be like. And there's obviously no guarantee any of us will live long enough to draw a pension. But we start to make choices now that are intended to shape a possible future which we might not live long enough to see or you know, stuff happens that derails that future from ever coming about. But we start to make decisions today based on our hopes and fantasies and imaginations about 10, 20, 30, 40 years into the future. It may be the case that when you first bump into someone and you fall in love and think, do I want to spend the rest of my life with this person? You go and meet your possible future in-laws and you look at the mother or father, as the case may be, and you think, is this what my beloved is going to look like in a few decades' time? And that may help to shape the decision you make about whether or not to marry them. Another element is practical evaluation. In order to exert agency, you've got to know what your range of choices is. Now, when I go down the tea and coffee aisle in the supermarket, I can just open my eyes and look at what the range of choices are. They're in front of me. I can see them. Not only can I see them, I can read the labels on the packet. If, if I was illiterate, it might be a different position. But I, I can see those possibilities and choose from them. But what if I were illiterate and I didn't know what half the things on the shelf were because I couldn't read the labels? Would that limit my choices? What if I had only just arrived in that country and I didn't speak the language and I couldn't read the language yet and I'm walking down an aisle in a, a Chinese supermarket or something and I can't read any of the labels because they're all in a language I don't read yet. Is that going to limit my capacity to know what to buy? To feel confident in buying something or, or might I just kind of panic and think, oh no, I've got no idea what this is so I better not buy it and leave it on the shelf. And that's just as a, a fairly low key example around shopping. That could influence, if you broaden this out to other areas, let's say education. Do people know what their educational options are? What subjects are taught in different universities? Do we know what universities there are across the country? I know the names of some universities, as I'm sure you do, but I don't know the names of every single university in the whole country nor do I know what subjects are taught in every single university across the whole country. So there may be subjects that are taught that I'd absolutely love doing, but I don't even know they are being taught in the first place. Therefore, I've got no option to go and study them because I don't even know they're there to start with. <laughs>
So my range of choice, my, my capacity for practical evaluation, is based upon the amount of information I can access. Do I know what the range of choice is, or do I only know about a small section of the possible choices available to me? Of that section that I know about, what is my understanding of that section? Have I got good insights into what's available or misguided insights, ill-informed insights? All of that sort of um, factor, the, the, the interaction between environment and my own experiences and understandings are going to influence my capacity to make choices in the first place. Structure is this is where we're starting to get into the realm of structure talking about practical evaluation but structure is the social forces in which each one of us lives and how those social forces push us steer us guide us throw us in certain directions which makes us subject to those social forces if you like it it limits our capacity for choice in some significant way Sociologists these days tend to be very, very interested in things like social class, ethnicity, religion, gender, well, not so much religion, but certainly gender, ethnicity and social class, and look at them as massive factors in shaping and influencing our choices. You may be able to think of other factors that you feel have more of an impact on your range of choices than your class does, or your race does, or your gender does. Um, let's say your state of health, for, for example, perhaps whether you're able-bodied or disabled, whether you um, are well-educated or badly educated, which is partly social class, but um, not wholly social class. What are the big factors at play that affect not only your life, but, and this is the key element of structure, affect the lives of vast numbers of other people? who are of the same ethnicity or the same gender or the same social class, etc., as you are. So whereas agency is your free will, structure is something that affects very large numbers of people at the same time. And so it's not just you that is influenced, which is why sociologists are particularly interested in structure, because they are interested in large numbers of people rather than tiny numbers of people. They, they like to know about the big forces rather than things that only affect one or two people. Have these factors changed in the course of modernity? So, for example, in 2020, are we as impacted and restricted by our social class as somebody who would have been alive in 1820 might have been impacted by their social class? Is gender as big an issue today as it was in 1620? It may be an issue in different ways, in um, different manifestations, or you may feel it's much less of an issue, or possibly you may feel it's much more of an issue. So how has the changes in society in modern times had an impact on the structures that um, shape and influence our lives? One of the factors One of the factors that has uh, an impact within modernity is the notion and indeed the, the reality of emancipation. Emancipation is, um, means, if you're un unfamiliar with the term, to set free, to take someone who is in a very restricted situation and set them free, liberate them to a, a, a freer state. So if you like, it's reducing the impact of the forces of structure from a sociological perspective on an individual's life so that social class or ethnicity or whatever it happens to be is less restrictive for them after emancipation than it was before emancipation and obviously we can think within the last couple of hundred years you've had the suffragist movement and women getting the vote there has been the civil rights movement in which laws have changed that affect black people and Asian people and so on in majority white countries and also affected other ethnic minorities in other parts of the world 
in majority black and majority Asian countries. Um, there has been changes in law regarding gay people and bisexual people, all sorts of changes that, in some countries at least, have produced greater freedom for people than they had before, as the nature of the social structures they live within changes. And so we could potentially make the argument that a key central feature of modernity is the granting of more freedoms, the extending of emancipation for different social groups. Is that the end all and be all of modernity? Could you have modernity in countries that don't want to see emancipation for specific groups? So if there's a country in which the authorities say, well, we don't want the same rights for women that you have in, in these other countries, but we do want the technology and we do want this and we do want that, can they still have a form of modernity whilst resisting social emancipation? Or do the two go hand in glove? Is emancipation automatically a good thing for everyone? Or does it sometimes cause problems? Bear in mind that a lot of the um, people opposing uh, the vote for women in the early days of the suffragette movement were themselves women. It wasn't just men opposing it. Sometimes there, there, there were women as well. Um, there have been um, black people in America who have been very critical of some of the uh, movements um, made within supposedly to liberate um, black people and change their situation. So, for example, um, the black economist Thomas Sowell suggests that the move made some decades ago now by the American government to um, change the Minimum Wage Act, to, to raise the minimum wage so that people in very low paid jobs got paid more, supposedly at the time that change was made, um, the government of the day advanced the idea that this would be for the benefit of black people and Hispanic people and so on in America, who tended by and large to do the very low paid jobs. Um, Thomas Sowell said actually that backfired and caused real problems for the black community. So not everyone is on board with all of the changes. Some people see them as causing more problems than they resolve. Again, when we have the class discussion, it'll be interesting to get your point of view on this issue. Another sociologist, Shmuel Eisenstadt, um, puts forward the idea that what we have is not one singular wave of modernity, but what he terms multiple modernities. And different countries around the world understand, interact with modernity in different ways. Some of them resist it entirely, and others adapt it to suit their ends. Um, Saudi Arabia is an example of a country that has taken on board the technological revolutions to a large extent, but resisted some of the emancipatory moves and changes there and tried to make amendments. China has taken the technology in wholly different directions, some of which, to people in the West, certainly to me, can seem very sinister and concerning and worrying. Um, the feminist movement in India has a very different understanding of what feminism means to the feminist movement in Britain, for example. So there, there's lots of different examples of ways in which Western assumptions about how modernity has to be don't pan out across the entire world, in which there are different understandings. Are some of those understandings better or worse or just simply different? Something to think about, research into, find out bits about other countries and, and if you have no pre-existing experience of them, and explore these ideas as we go along. And Eisenstadt says that as time rolls by, bearing in mind this is back in 87, so it's already happened in a sense, as time rolls past, these different approaches to modernity will spread. In other words, the West won't just impose itself on the entire world. Other parts of the world, more and more overtly, will do things differently. And maybe the West will come to do things differently, given sufficient time. We'll consider the impact of Marxist views as we go along, uh, but to, to touch a little bit on them at the moment, 
Uh, we've already mentioned the shift. Uh, Marx was very interested in the workplace and the idea of who owns the means of production, whether it's the workers themselves or an upper class elite exploiting the workers and, and various arguments around that um, vein. But we have already looked at this idea of the shift from a predominantly agricultural economy to a predominantly industrial economy, which lends, it, mar lends itself to a Marxist interpretation because Marx's ideas only developed in the wake of industrialization. They didn't exist because he wasn't alive, of course, back during the agri predominantly agricultural era. As we move potentially out of industrialization and artificial intelligence and the information revolution, and the computer revolution becomes more and more overt in the world, will Marx's ideas become very out of date? Some people suggest they've already become out of date. Or will they take us in new directions and lead to different understandings? Um, investment capitalism we've described a little bit already, but we'll come back to that in more detail in future classes. But essentially Marx's ideas are a reaction against investment capitalism. The idea of the, the wealthy um, tycoon who doesn't know anything about making cars but buys up a car making factory and invest money in the, the workers and the employees who do know how to make cars. And so the, the, um, the tycoon can cream off big old profits whilst other people put their skills to use in developing his business, or indeed her business as the case may be. We could explore, and we indeed will explore in future classes, this idea that um, Social class has perhaps, or at least it did in Marx's lifetime, we can debate whether it's still the case now, taken the place of the earlier tribal allegiances of previous centuries. So at an earlier juncture, people would have been very, very conscious of which tribe they lived in and very conscious of which tribes other people lived in and formed allegiances accordingly. As the tribal systems began to break down with the Industrial Revolution, social class became a more prominent issue, the notion of class consciousness, which Karl Marx argues is key to liberating people from oppressive circumstances, came to the fore. And not just class consciousness for the working classes, but you can see examples of class consciousness amongst the middle and upper classes of looking after their own vested interests and seeing people from other classes as almost like a rival tribe rather than fellow members of the self-same society. But that's going back 150, well over 150 years, to look at those ideas. Can we still understand them in 2020? Is social class a massive issue in Britain today, or has it faded into the background? We'll think about that over the coming weeks and discuss it both in class and in the Teams chat. One of um, Karl Marx's followers, uh, people who was very inspired by his ideas, Max Weber, came up with his own views. Um, we will go over those in a lot more detail as we roll along. But he argued that as society became more and more industrialised, uh, Weber, if you're unfamiliar with him, was alive in the Victorian era and into the very early part of the 20th century. Um, as society became much more industrialized, it became a lot more bureaucratic, and we developed very strong centralized governments to run society as it became much more technology-based. He suggests that faith in traditional religion declined with the upsurge of vast factories and, and all those cotton mills in the north during the early part of the Industrial Revolution with the breakdown of rural communities as people flooded into the cities and didn't know half their neighbours. Faith in religion, he said, began to decline and decline and decline. And a, a form of faith in science and technology to solve all of our problems took the place of a faith in, in God and a faith in the saints and so on to solve our problems. So in this sense, faith is understood in the idea of, of a kind of blind trust in that the vast majority of people who use technology often don't understand how it works. A bit like me in computers, 
I know which buttons to press, but I don't understand really how half of it works. So I take it on trust that it, it does what I need it to do and will continue doing what I want it to do into the future without really understanding it. So it's, it's perhaps trust is a better word than faith, but there is a kind of a, a, a blindness to both in the just as people don't really understand God, so in this context they don't really understand science either. They just listen to all those long words that the people in white coats tell them and trust them to know what the hell they're talking about. He argues that um, with the decline in religion, we get a decline in, in wonder, in the sense of life being marvellous and magical and there being pixies in the forest and um, the, the chance to meet with our long dead ancestors when we get to the afterlife. Uh, a faith in, and a feeling that life is somehow magical and special. Uh, he refers to that quote from the ancient Roman writer Tacitus there, Omne ignotum pro magnifico. Everything seems wondrous when unknown. But if you don't understand the way the world works, everything feels magical. And that sense of magic makes life better. Now, has science just done away with that sense of magic and we now live in this easily explainable, somewhat dull world in which vast numbers of people are on antidepressants because life is so ch challenging and difficult and, and, and disheartening at times? Or have we replaced one sense of wonder, the wonder at nature, with another sense of wonder, the wonder of technology, because we don't understand it either? Um, because technology is largely an unknown thing, we, we, it all feels a bit weird and wonderfully magical. Do you feel technology is weird and wonderfully magical or, or not? <laughs> Skipped one there. Um, that chap in the painting is Thomas Malthus, who was a vicar uh, back in the 17 and early 1800s. As well as being a vicar, he also wrote books on economy and advanced a number of ideas. We won't look at all of them, we'll just look at a couple of ideas today because other ideas we can think about later in the course. Uh, one of the ideas he advanced reflected his concerns about the size of the population. And obviously the population, he was British, the population of Britain is way bigger now than it was in the, the late 1700s, so Lord knows what he would make of today's society. But he was really worried about the vast numbers of people cramming into cities, the spread of disease, um, the lack of sanitation, that there were loads and loads and loads of people starving to death or coming very close to starving to death in the streets because there wasn't enough food to go around, um, people having way more kids than they could afford to look after, all sorts of concerns he had, which many people still have today, of course. He was of the opinion that nature takes care of itself in that plagues and famines and warfare and so on happen and reduce the numbers and therefore society will balance itself out. Whereas if he, um, people in charge, and he was thinking partly of the church of which he was a member, but also government, if they go out of their way to try and help people soup kitchens for the starving and so on, then rather than those numbers evening themselves out, they will artificially grow larger and larger because people are being kept alive despite the fact that nature is doing its best to bump them off. Which he felt was not good in the long run. That it would be better to leave the vast numbers to be reduced through what you might term natural wastage until nature had found its own balance where there would be no more people in the world than the resources could sustain than to bend over backwards to keep vast numbers of people alive against the odds. So not the most charitable soul in the world you might think. But despite his lack of charity his ideas had a massive impact on society at the time and in the, the centuries since. Now he died bef a couple of years before the Irish potato famine happened. But even though he was dead, his ideas were still very prominent in government. So when the Irish potato famine was happening, 
happening. Uh, just to clarify for anyone who's not very familiar with that period of history, um, vast numbers of working class Irish people depended on farming their own potatoes in order to feed themselves, as well as to sell off the extra for profit. Then a, a blight came along that affected potatoes and wiped most of the potato crop out for several years. And whilst the middle classes and the wealthy people in Ireland had lots of other vegetables and, and you know, cows and pigs and sheep and what not to eat as well, poor people really pretty much only had potatoes. So when their potatoes were gone, they couldn't afford to eat anything else and they couldn't grow anything else on their land because they didn't have the money to go and buy seeds for other types of plants and so on. So they basically starved. Over the course of a few short years, about a million people starved to death in Ireland and another million people emigrated to America and Canada and Australia and Hawaii and Britain to get away from the starvation in Ireland and find a new life somewhere else. So the population of Ireland in the space of a few years dropped by about two million people. The Irish government turned for help to the British government and said, what do we do? And various different people within British government had different ideas. There were those who very much wanted to help and who would go and set up soup kitchens like the Quakers did, for example, ran soup kitchens in Ireland during the famine. Um, the Sultan of Turkey sent large amount of money over to the Irish. Um, one of the Native American tribes in America had a big old Whitlam with the Choctaw and they sent a lot of money to Ireland, even though they had hardly any of their own. Um, but the loudest voices in the British government were heavily influenced by Malthus's policies, and they said quite openly, if you feed people with soup kitchens and that sort of thing, they will get lazy. They won't sort out their own problems, they won't get off their backside and get, get on their metaphorical bike and find a job. They'll just sit there with their hand out expecting to be fed and fed and fed. And therefore charity is a bad thing because it's being doled out to people who w will not then sort out their own problems. And so the British government, because of these very loud voices, eventually opposed all kinds of charity moves and money that was donated from various causes mysteriously disappeared. So nothing much changes into the modern world. Um, and didn't make its way to the starving people who needed it because of, largely because of Malthus's ideas, this notion that things like famines and plagues are nature's way of taking care of the excess population and that any interference in this by well-meaning people causes more problems in the long run than it cures. So this, this is a sort of a, mo a modernist approach, if you like, one of the grimmer features of modernism and even though a lot of people these days have probably never heard of Thomas Malthus you can see echoes of his opinions being spouted by different politicians the world over and not just politicians you can hear it from you know, conversations down the pub and at bus stops and all that sort of thing so these are widespread ideas that have outlasted the name of the person who put them into the public arena in the first place. The quote there, um, if they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population is not, I'm hoping you will instantly recognise, from Thomas Malthus himself. It's from Ebenezer Scrooge, who as a character was heavily influenced by the views and opinions of Thomas Malthus of Dickens when he was writing A Christmas Carol kind of based Scrooge on Thomas Malthus's attitudes and outlooks to quite a large extent. Um, Malthus did say that there were two main ways of um, controlling population size, what he termed positive checks, so things like disease and warfare and so on that would wipe out big numbers very quickly, but also preventative checks things that you could do to stop people being born in the first place, like you know, distributing condoms or getting large numbers of people to be celibate, that sort of thing, through, through religion, chiefly. Um, and that would help. Now, he said he felt the preventative measures were kinder in the long run, 
because obviously they don't involve large numbers of people dying. It's about stopping births rather than ending lives. Kinder, but often quite difficult to implement. So his ultimate idea was to have a lot more preventative measures in society, if possible, to reduce the overabundance of numbers. Now, this is the overabundance of numbers amongst people who cannot support themselves because they lack the resources. So fundamentally, if you were very rich and you, you wanted 20 kids, you could have 20 kids because you were rich enough to feed them all. If you were dirt poor and you couldn't afford to three, feed three children, then you shouldn't have three children. So chiefly, these notions of positive checks and preventative checks are applied mainly to the very poor, not across the board to every level of society. It's to people who don't have the resources. And he's not Malthus asking the question, why don't they have the resources? He's assuming it's because they're lazy and useless and feckless and you know, don't take care of themselves properly. He's not asking the kinds of questions that Marx would ask later on about are they being withheld from them by greedy people higher up society who pay terrible, terrible low wages and then hobble the profits for themselves. So is whereas Marx saw this as more of a problem of unfair distribution of resources, Malthus saw this as more the individual weaknesses of people who drank too much, had too many kids, couldn't keep a job down, all that sort of thing. Um, Foucault, Michel Foucault, a sociologist who became very, very famous in the 60s, 1960s that is, um, we'll be looking at him in a lot more detail as we go along. He picked up on these sorts of ideas and talked about notions like positive checks and preventative checks using the term biopolitics to describe the ways in which people in power develop policies to encourage things like birth control, limit population numbers, um, regulate the size of the population so when it gets too low they try and push the population up and when it gets too high they try and push the population down through the use of politics and policies. Shili Mabembe is a Cameroonian philosopher still alive, very much influenced by the teachings of Foucault, who added his own ideas, which he called necropolitics, and said that governments not only regulate things like birth rates and how healthy the population is by whether or not they run free clinics or whether they may make healthcare a paid private thing, but they also regulate death rates by um, choosing not to look after certain groups of people and so effectively just leaving them to die for example homeless people or going out of their way indeed in some government some cases to slaughter large numbers of people that the, the Nazi government did with the Jews and the gypsies and disabled people and so on um, bending over backwards to reduce the number of certain sectors of society so it's not only about the management of life, but also about the management of death. But we will explore Mbembe's ideas in more depth as we go along in the course. Not just this week, but next week too. Now, as it's speaking of next week, something I'd like you to do, and I've mentioned this quite a few times already, but um, whereas so far we've been talking about the idea of is society in general getting better, getting worse, etc. And it's all been at a very generalised level. I'd like you to, ready for discussion in class next week, jot down a bit of paper somewhere, details of your own life. Whatever age you are, you will have seen changes. During the course of your life, have the changes in politics, in technology, in healthcare, in philosophy, religion, education, all sorts of areas. Have they made your life better? Have they made your life worse? Is it been a bit of both? Is your life better now than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if you're old enough, 30 years ago, 40 years ago? Is it much the same? Is it a lot worse than it was? I suspect in most people's cases it's going to be a mixture of the good and the bad in different areas of life. But start to think about the direct impact on your own life. And you can also maybe think about the direct impact on family, on close friends, 
where you've seen people whose lives have either been made much better or, or much, potentially much worse by changes that have happened over the course of the last few decades. And then we can kind of bring that personal element. Now, obviously, it's a big class, so we're not going to be in a position where everyone gets to put their two pennies worth in, otherwise there'll be no lecture at all. But we can scatter a few ideas in next week and a few more ideas in the week after that and the week after that. So over the course of the remainder of the year, everyone will get the opportunity, if they want it, to talk about how these changes are affecting you directly. Speaking of which, we're now at the end, which will be a relief, no doubt, to most of you. Certainly a relief to my throat. Um, next week, back in class for a normal lecture, and we'll be picking up on this idea of how these big sociological concepts apply to everyday life, to ordinary people, not just these grandiose ideas, but how they boil down for us on a day-to-day -day basis. And we'll talk about the, the notion of individualism the notion that we are individuals, which not all societies have held, in fact the vast majority haven't. And we'll talk about the ways in which that affects things like politics and agency, the capacity for choice. Uh, this is kind of the difference between you, you deciding who you want to marry and your family arranging a marriage for you. Are you an individual or are you a member of a collective? <coughs> And we'll start to think about how modernity affects men and women in slightly different ways and the kind of gender relationships that go on there. Um, and we'll explore that then. So I'll see some of you at least in the um, Microsoft chat. That's The chat is mainly aimed at those of you who um, have questions or just feel like social contact as much as anything else. If you've got no questions at all, then you, you don't particularly need to take part in the chat. But if you do, it would be nice to see you there uh, and we can have a bit of a banter going about these ideas. Anyway, take care and speak to you soon.